We're in our home stretch. I know this is the last leg, and I've noticed some people are sort of fidgeting a bit, but hopefully you've had a good day and a half. And we have lots more exciting stuff ahead of us. We're going to hear from some people who are going to talk about brands, followed by my friend Howard, who's going to talk about uh, his experiences during 9-11. Um, and then we'll hear from Incentive Fox and Professor Suarez. Eric will be here. Eric and Ivan Sandberg will host a fireside chat, and then Eric will close off with giving you some insights about Google. So without further ado, let's get our four panelists for our brand conversation up on stage. You guys want to join me? As you can see, we haven't quite rehearsed this. We're trying not to fall. Exactly. There we go. This is perfect. OK, good. We have the right order then. So we thought, decided because we were going to talk about brands, rather than me introduce these people, we're going to let them introduce themselves as brands. So you're a brand. You've managed yourself for your life. You've done phenomenal things in your life. Can you share with us in a few minutes what does that brand embody and how did you get here and what's the brand journey been? Sure, and, and I appreciate you saying I've done phenomenal things, but no one does anything alone. So part of my brand is I recognize that everything happens with teams of people and by bringing diverse perspectives and diverse thinking into room can create such a greater outcome. So something that's been um, important to me in my career is really listening to people and not just listen to hear them, but really listening to understand and then seeing how we can take ideas into action. And so I started my career at Coke 15 years ago in Hispanic marketing. And fast forward, you know, 15 years later, being the chief marketing officer of a phenomenal brand, knowing that someone else actually created it, I did, and it's 124 years old. So I have to keep that legacy and the strength of the brand. But also where we are in this world where multicultural consumers are the fastest growing population. I look at that and I say making those connections and leveraging and tapping into the people throughout my career, I think is gonna, what's gonna be continued to make Coca-Cola a phenomenal brand. And I'm fortunate that I get to be a part of it. So I feel like in, in if I had to talk about me as a brand, it's really about making connections and understanding people and behaviors. Fantastic. So Laura, you spend a lot of time dealing with people like B. Her, yeah. Like her. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, can you talk about Laura, the brand, and what you've done with, uh, with, with Starco? Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think starting at home might be a good place to start. I, I grew up uh, with with a dad telling me just about every time we were in the car driving somewhere alone, you know, Laura, you can be whatever you want to be. And, you know, as a child of the 70s and 80s, you know, I benefited from things like Title IX and, and uh, a lot of uh, unbelievable legislation and court rulings that really opened up opportunities for women. So um, that kind of partners with my mom who uh, damn well made sure I was going to be everything <laughs> I, I wanted to be. Uh, and so a little bit of dreamer and a little bit of discipline. Um, I started at Leo Burnett Advertising about 23 years ago, and truthfully, I would have left a long, long time ago in my journey in advertising, but there always was something two to three to four years um, that challenged me a bit further. Uh, whether it was living in different uh, countries of the world, uh, whether it was working on you know, domestic assignments, global assignments, um, you know, just this sense of I could always push the outer boundaries. Uh, and that kind of fearlessness or that sense of restlessness has, I think, uh, carried me well uh, because it's, it's actually led me to try to build teams that not only make things happen but also help push me out of a comfort zone or work with clients who not only help build capability but push us to do better and better things on their behalf. Uh, so, you know, from that perspective, I think uh, some of those, those those elements have shaped you know, what I think is sort of becoming the next stage of who I am or who I will become, which is you know, just know, you know, being, being a leader of a large organization um, and, and, and what my role in that organization is as a leader. And you start to move much more into purpose, uh, into what you stand for. You can't do it all. Uh, you have to bring clarity. You have to simplify things for people. So, as I've, as I've taken over the helm of Starcom MediaVest Group, I've really spent a lot more time about you know, understanding my role in shaping vision, understanding my role in, a, in, in, in inspiring and assembling a great team, and then understanding my role in shaping a culture. 
not only for our company, but with our clients, because I believe that our culture is very connected to great clients like B and, 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 and several people here in the room. Great, so Guy, you manage brands, but you're a brand yourself. Now, I overheard you say earlier, you're driven purely by fear. <laughs> well, I started by fear. Okay. Um, the, f you're, the first time I'd ever um, thought of as an executive as a brand was when I was 17, 18 years old, I met David Geffen. And uh, David, and, and I come from the music business, and David is really the king of all kings in the music business. And what I was blown away by was how uh, he mentored me, and, and I would see Bill Clinton coming to his house, and I would see uh, actors, and um, me, and, and agents, and all types of, Warren Beatty, and, and I would think like, this guy, 99% of his money and, 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 and work comes from music, yet no one looked at him as just the music guy. They looked at David Geffen as, he's our guy, and he connects us. And so I immediately, you know, uh, ran with that concept. And um, because I was working with uh, Madonna, what was to be Maverick Records at 17, 18 years old, I was one of the first kids to have a real job. And so I immediately started to um, do the same thing in my world. And, and, and if a, an actor or a comedian or a musician or a model or a director or a writer, if they were bubbling up, if they were uh, um, doing something and, and, and it was connecting, I would immediately bring them in. And I would, they'd stay at my house, they'd live on my couches, they would, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would take them in and, and really be uh, an ear and, 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 and connect dots for them. And so now, 20 years later, I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, even the music was a big part of my base, I don't think people see me as uh, the music guy, they see me as a connector. And today I have uh, a partner in a management company for actors, and I'm developing films and developing brands. And, and, and now I'm connecting those same people 20 years later to some of the people in the audience today on how to um, um, reach their goals or their potential brand and brand connectivity. So well, that's... You know, you're responsible for my daughter being crazy about vampires. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Were you responsible for the Twilight series in some I, I got very lucky with the Twilight thing. Um, but uh, Stephanie Meyer is, is, is really responsible. I just was able to push it along one step forward. There we go. Now, David, you, uh, as we talked about earlier, the fastest way to make a million is to start with a billion in the airline industry, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> you've done it four times. So tell I us about that. I don't know how I ended up in this, in this business. But you know, I, it's interesting, because when I, when I speak on college campuses and I speak to audiences and, you know, in different places in Brazil or Stanford or wherever, I always ask this question. Um, think of five companies that you absolutely adore that you love, that you, you know, you don't even look, check price, you don't check anything, you just go straight there every time they, a new product or something you're just connected to. And you know what I, my, my experience is that most people can't think of five, <laughs> which I think is really great if you want to start a business because there's very few companies that people are absolutely insured to, connected to. We're gonna do that now, so, David, you know that. So, right? so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, um, I see myself as, as a person that tries to create companies like that. And, it, and it's pretty simple formula. It's not complicated. You don't have to read volumes of business books to figure it out. It's actually really simple. But it requires a, a ton of focus. And it's managing details every single day, customer at a time. And you know, we, we did that at JetBlue. Um, you know, I find that companies that have a bigger loyal following make more money, have higher profit margins, grow quicker, you know, and, and I watched at JetBlue where, you know, we started out with three flights a day, Fort Lauderdale, New York, Delta had three or four flights, and the next thing you know, we had 25 flights and they still had three. You know, why do we have 25 and they had three? Obviously, people like this better than they like flying on them. And uh, so it's, you know, it's really just hiring the best people um, and training them well. And, and you know, I, I have two goals for, for our airline in Brazil. It's very simple, I just said, I want, and I tell our people, I want this, I want you 30 years from now to be able to say, this is the best job you ever had. 30 years? 30 years, 40 years, two weeks, two months. I want you to tell your grandkids when they say, what was your best job? Say, Azul, it was the best job I ever had. And then I want every customer to get off a plane saying, wow, that was the best flight I ever had. I said, if we can just accomplish those two things, and I can't do number two without number one, then we're gonna, we're gonna grow quicker than everyone else, we're gonna be more successful, 
And so in our second year, we're going to do you know, half a billion in sales. Next year, probably a billion. And we're growing. And, and we're doing it just because we have a lot of loyal customers. And, and uh, you know, we're trying to be um, flawless in our execution in every single area. If we mess up, we try and make it right with our customers. And we have the best people. It's a very simple formula. But you know, if you lose focus, and I think you know, for those of you that have flown JetBlue in the last couple of years, I don't think it's the same company as it used to be. It's still better, I think, than everybody else. But it's a focus issue. It's like focus every day, every day on those little things, lines, ticket counters, you know, um, uh, waiting on, on the phones, timing every bag to every carousel to make sure that every bag's off in 20 minutes. Those are the things that customers really appreciate. So, 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 so that's my brand. It's, yeah. it's just trying to create, you know, take very simple principles, organize people together, try and teach them these principles and have them teach each other and grow a company that is in a commodity business that is growing quicker than other companies that has better profits um, and, and just creating a, a better company. So that's, that's why so I'm, I try to What's do. the simple formula for Coke? I mean, what's the simple formula just like that simple formula? Now it's about the know, customer you know and the, the experience. You know the formula secret. We don't give that oh, secret formula. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's the reason we don't know the formula for Coke. That's exactly so right. So like Google, we don't give the secret. Don't algorithm. give the secret yes. away. Now, you know, for us, we talk a lot about brand love and brand values. So having people say they love the brand is just as important as driving profitability for us because we know that one leads to the other. And what's your insight? Why do people love Coke? You know, it's interesting. If you ask someone, why do you drink Coke, not love Coke, but if you first start with that, why do you drink Coke, most of them say, oh, I remember when I was a kid and I got to have it at my birthday party and my parents let me have it in the glass bottle and it was so cold. And they talk about the experience with friends and family. It's very rare that they say, oh, it was really great, I was thirsty and dehydrated and it hydrated me. And so thinking about the extrinsics and getting people to tap into those emotional connections. And what I loved about the sessions here today is I saw little glimpses of neuroscience and research around how that connection happens mm -hmm. in the brain. And that's something that we're still trying to understand. So we're on a journey there. But we know that if we have the right imagery, the right messaging, and contextually relevant ways of family and friends, that it seems to drive that love for the brand. So Guy, what helps drive, you know, what's the simple formula for managing individual brands? And David talked about building a great business around customer service. Uh, he talked about Coke. You manage Madonna, right? Yeah. Well, what's, what's the story, what's the simple formula for her brand? Uh, well, if, if I started out of fear, she started out of being fearless. Um, I mean, she is absolutely, you know, up for any challenge and um, is more excited by um, new innovative ways to do things and new sounds, new ideas, new fashion than uh, looking at what's happening today. Um, and she, she just is willing to take risks. I think the key thing is, is being fearless and hard, hardcore work ethic, but uh, r really willing to take risks, willing to maybe fall flat on your face um, but just do what feels right to you and, and, and you know, um, just race your own race. So, Laura, what about, you work with lots of brand customers. In your mind, who are some of the examples, we'll do the David trick, name those three or four sure. brands that, corporate brands that you believe have a very simple story and they execute perfectly to that story. Sure, I mean, um, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Procter & Gamble, um, Blackberry Rim, um, Kellogg. Uh, Notice no digital brands in there. No digital brands? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, every once in a while we, we, uh, we do some projects and do some consulting work on the side, but um, uh, what I find actually is very interesting is, uh, you know, transforming and reframing brick and mortar brands or tangible brands into, um, into competing in this new space. And, and, and integrating both sides of the brands. So you've What's got- What's the best example recently? Well, Walmart, for example, Walmart, walmart.com, very interesting story. I mean, um, uh, very few people know that if you click on any, if you order anything at walmart.com, you can have it shipped for free and pick it up at the store two days later. So will they take Amazon um, on that way? Well, you know what? I don't think they want to focus on just one channel because I think they think that with .com and, and the stores, they can compete on a multi-channel basis. They can be and, and, mm -hmm. and. And I think that for them it's an appropriate strategy. But I think what's kind of interesting when I look at some of the, the clients that we work with is, it, I think that the old 
dynamics of the traditional marketing model were really set on love and respect. And B did a great job of explaining why, you know, Coke is a loved brand. Google is a loved brand. It's also a respected brand. Um, I think that what's going to be interesting in the new 21st century era of marketing is I think you're going to be balancing now love, respect, and utility. So this notion of I can take action with this brand. This brand enables me to do something. This brand facilitates, whether it be purpose-based marketing or something that's specific, you know, closer to home. Um, this brand helps me live a healthier life. This brand helps me with health and wellness. So I, I, I think it'll be interesting to watch great brands now shift from balancing love, respect, to now balancing love, respect, and this notion of action or utility. And, and, and there's no doubt in my mind the digital world and the, and, and the internet has to, it will, it will live there for them and they're going to have to embrace that in order to get to that third leg on the stool. So David, you talked about you give these speeches and people tell you there are three or four brands that they love. What are the ones that come up most often? Well, Apple obviously comes up with everybody, you know, in, in a lot of ways, but, you know, it's, um, you know, for a while there, Dell had a, had a really strong following. If you want to just talk about the technology side, there's clothing, you know, Nordstrom, I think, always comes up to, in, in people's story. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people sell clothes and they just do it different. You know, they train their people to make you feel better when you walk in the store. So, you know, like I said, these things aren't, aren't difficult. And it's amazing to me that, um, you know, people haven't tried it more. You know, JetBlue, we can't, um, unfortunately, we can't do this in Brazil because so many laws down there and there's so, you know, costs are completely different. But so Brazil has JetBlue, more laws that constrain advertising than the U.S.? Well, they, they constrain a lot of stuff, but one of them <laughs> is that every single, if you call a JetBlue, every single person that you call will be in their home, in their furry slippers and bathrobe, talking to you on the phone at 2 in the morning or midnight, home with their kids, and so they're just happier people. And they, they, you know, I think that's one of the strengths of JetBlue is the people on the phones. So it's some, simple. Why wouldn't everyone do that? You know, so why? When I call JetBlue, somebody's in their bathrobe at home on their yeah. phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, every single An person. Interesting experience. Every single person. So they're in their comfortable chair. They're relaxing. You know, they're not having to drive. You know, get dressed and drive across town, and get in a call center that's hot and stuffy or noisy. So they're just happier people because of that. And why wouldn't everyone do that? You know, it's better for the, econ the environment, it's better for... This is a new call center model. Everybody should just shift them back to people's homes. Yeah, it's a, so, it's, so it's a very simple thing, but nobody does it just because they just have this paradigm that they can't control the people. And you can control them just as well because you have all the... You can listen in, you can check their stats, everything the same. So just a little st stupid thing like that, but those people, you know, it's 2,000 people and they just have a happier life. So, That's interesting. Um, you know, we, it's, you know, same thing in Brazil. In Brazil, our, our, you know, our people, the culture down there is a little different. I mean, there's a separation between management and people. They eat in different lunchrooms. They, you know, there is a little bit more of a, uh, it's not egalitarian. It's more aristocratic. So I, you know, eat in the lunchroom with them. I go work the airport. I, you know, shake all their hands, and they're just, like, blown away. They're just like, why would you? I've never met the CEO of any company I've ever worked for before. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, it just seems s silly not to. But it just makes them more loyal, you know, to the company. So it's just little, little things like that, and then consistency and treating people well in every every turn. That's interesting. You're you're always focusing on the customer experience or the employee experience. Uh, that's it. Well, you can't you can't have a, you can't force them to to take care of customers unless they're taken care of first. So you know, it, you know, we live by things like net promoter scores and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's it's not that hard. It really isn't. It just needs to focus, and it's something you wake up and think about. You know, really, you know, every single day. So, Guy, who are the top five individual brands you you sort of think about when you talked about Madonna as being a being a brand? It's individual five brands. Individual brands. Um, I would say Oprah. I would say Madonna. Um, I would say um, Michael Jordan. Still. That's uh, a very U.S. centric view, no? Yeah. <laughs> and I would say. Um, I'm thinking worldwide. Um, Ronaldo would be. Uh, um, uh, sports is 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 always uh, universal. Um, so that those are the four. I mean, there was a panel earlier in the morning over here where they talked about Osama bin Laden being a brand. Right. Oh, Jesus is a brand for sure. Jesus mm -hmm. is a brand. There he rocks. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so now, there were also there's a big conversation around how do you create a positive brand towards change? You know, they were talking about the, the yeah, tank, I, they were talking I about. Yeah, I would love to sit with Osama Bin Laden and say, okay, let's manage your brand. It's really bad right now in some areas. <laughs> And, so uh, what would you do? I mean, uh, well, uh, he'd be doing lectures, putting out <laughs> books. Um, I would definitely, you know, he, he, it would be a big change. It would be a big announcement on Oprah. Got it. Yeah. And so you'd be leveraging one yeah, brand for the he's other. Gonna come, his kids, he's got a thousand kids. They're all going to show up. They're going to, you know, give him hugs. And, and we're going to make keys. <laughs> I'm going to have shave that's Yahoo's going to be there. It's we'll going to be lots of tears. <laughs> And we're gonna make peace, and and then then there goes the tour. And I put them on tour, <laughs> stadiums but, everywhere. But stadiums. on a more serious note, we talked about leveraging an individual's brand. Now, now, how do you take a brand like Madonna and continue to build it from here? Well, I mean, luckily, you know, you, they always say you never want to manage uh, a client who whose career you want more than they want, <laughs> right? And and you will find them. You will find them like, come on, I got. What do you mean you're canceling this? I just spent three months setting this up. Oh. Um, and, and, and with her, you know, she's determined. So it's always, you're always better off immediately out the gate with someone who has determination. Um, and, um, you know, she is always, I'll, I'll give you an a, a example of something which, which gives you the mindset. Um, when uh, our last record deal was up, we had 25 years at Warner Brothers Records. And um, we sat down and discussed, you know, okay, what do you want to do? We'll go renegotiate. And traditionally what, everyone does is renegotiate their deal, and a legacy artist will be able to um, get back their first few albums. That, that, that is, uh, so you can go back and, 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 and th those will come back to you. They revert back. So I said, you know, one of the things that we can go and ask for if you want to stay with Warner Brothers is you can get back your first few albums. Now, that's a very emotional moment for an artist uh, to think that their first song, the thing that they wrote when they first made it, their first albums, it's, it's everything to them is the beginning. And wow, I get the ownership of that back. And so that, that, that usually is, a, you know, 10 out of 10, a, a yes, how do I do that? And, and shockingly, her immediate answer to me was, why do I want my first albums back? And I, I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, I don't care about my past. I care about my future. Let the past be the past. I'm more excited about what's next. And really, that defines who she is, because that's not the easy answer. The easy answer is, let's stick with what we've been doing. It's traditional. And, and she chose to take a different path. We don't even know what that path is today. But what we know is, is it's not the traditional path, and that she's willing to shake it up again, and, and that she could care less about what everyone else you know, considers everything to them, and willing to let go of that and start brand new. So Laura, we're, we're the topic is mind shift. We're talking about thinking differently and changing sort of gears. Uh, there's a lot of conversation around the digital revolution, people going online, 1.7 billion people on the web. Uh, there's a notion out there that brands are getting built faster than they ever used to get built. There's a 124-year-old brand called Coke. There's a 10-year-old brand called Google. Probably a five-year-old brand, brand called Facebook. What is your view for you know, how sort of the instant branding that's going on now, you know, brands getting formed in five years and getting to the top of the charts, and 100-year-old brands, they're sort of you know, having to be secondary to these kinds of brands. What is your advice or what is your view on that topic for all the people here who are building brands, who are running businesses? And how do you manage that brand in that such a fast-paced environment? Do you still do what David's talking about? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think there's a, a the mind, sh mind shift uh, that I think is most acute for, for large advertisers is this notion of shifting time. So brand building was a longer period of time you would work for months on a campaign that might be, maybe had three or four commercials that would run for six months to a year. You'd work for months on one great ad that might run in the Super Bowl. Uh, now, um, there, is no, uh, there is no space and time. Constant optimization, constant iteration. Um, very few, fewer and fewer clients are spending their time on those great three ads that are going to run for six months and, and instead are trying to figure out, okay, how do I efficiently version? How do I scale and produce things much easier so I can have my media companies segment and sequence different types of content? A lot of other companies are really kind of coming to grips now with this notion of, we talked about it yesterday at the panels, this notion of you know, what's, what's free, what's paid, what's owned. 
you know, the, own, the ownable media assets that companies enjoy are not leveraged at all. I think that we're looking at a pivot point where people are going to start leveraging them much more, and, and the Internet is a classic place to do that. Earned is, I think, probably the space right now that's getting the most churn. Um, it's not just mobile, it's mobility. I think the iPad has kind of opened up our minds to the fact that, you know what, um, I have a very different media experience with the iPad than I do with a smaller screen on, on the mobile. Uh, and, uh, but I can take it with me. So I think this notion of portable, mo you know, portable mobility is, is changing. This notion of, of um, free uh, media, this notion of how do I integrate my PR programs into this. So the thing that I think that a lot of brand builders are looking at now is how do I string together elements of paid, elements of owned, elements of earned together, and how do I measure that? And how do I prove that it's either building my brand equity, uh, improving my consumer or customer delight, and how do I then continue to optimize it and, and, and show and build on it so that I'm building more and more shareholder value? One of, these th one of the things that I think you're going to start to see is that um, uh, we need to start to think of CMOs not so much as just brand builders, but I think builders of, sh of brand value that does have a monetary value on, on a balance sheet and to the board. And, uh, and we know this to be true. And I, and, I, and I, for one, as we get you know, smarter about managing business metrics, I, for one, want us to start to make these connections so that we know how brand Coca-Cola enhances the shareholder value of the Coca-Cola company in a way that we can track and we can hold CMOs much more accountable to it over these next five to 10 years. I think that's when our discipline will really exponentially go to the next, next uh, next level and, and uh, there'll be, a, I think, a, a, a greater group of people who want to get in and say, I want to manage brands, I want to build brands. So Bina, how does Coke deal with this digital revolution? Does Coke have a Facebook page, tweet and everything? We do, and so... What do you tweet, what does Coke tweet about? Drink me more? <laughs> well, let me, yeah. <laughs> let, let me back up and start with a little bit about how we got into it. So in 2006, we were looking at creating a loyalty program, and it was around people's passions and following the consumers. And so we titled this thing Project Access, and we didn't really know what to do with it, but we said, you know, how come you know the the airline industry the credit card industry has this great formula with their consumers where they can reward their most loyal consumers and give them this extra value that people then you know hoard and seek and, and only stay within those partnerships mm -hmm. so how do we do that but we wanted to flip the model to not just provide a catalog but to follow where people wanted to get those rewards so ultimately, this project turned into what we call MyCook Rewards today. And you know, it's not inexpensive to do something like that. We wanted to try to understand the digital space in terms of our brands and spend our own money to build this community so we would own the data. And today, we have over 15 million registered users on MyCook Rewards. And you know, every second, people are burning about 44 points on this platform. So we're, the platform is amazing, and what it taught us is that, because we've had some key learnings along the way, that what had to be um, put onto this platform around providing people access to the things they love needed to be relevant and culturally relevant and relevant for the time and day. So even though we started in 2006, what we offer today is very different from what we offered in 2006. And then connecting it in the social media landscape, so. Now let me get to Facebook for a moment. There were two individuals who started the Coca-Cola Facebook fan site. Coca-Cola didn't do that. How many followers? So, well, over, today there's over 11 million followers. Oh. And we had gotten a call from Facebook and they said, you know, we want Coca-Cola to take over this site because that's part of our policies and how we do this. And we didn't even know the site existed. So we worked with our digital teams inside of our building and we called those individuals had them you know, come into Atlanta at Coke, and what they did was really interesting. They followed their journey through video, and they followed the whole journey in the visit to Coca-Cola, and now today we collaborate with them to keep the site alive. And so they keep the pulse on what consumers want. We provide them with the content. They're, in, in essence, considered employees now of the brand. But we try to keep it an arm's length to allow them to tell us what to do because they're closest to the consumer and to what's happening. And by taking that community, connecting it with the MyCook Rewards community, 
it allows us to do um, some really great programs that do make a difference. Do you think every brand should have a Facebook page? So, you know, I, I don't know. I think that you have to follow the consumers. If consumers think it should have a page and get interested in it, then they should. <laughs> do you have a, does Azul have a Facebook oh, yeah. Orchid oh, yeah. page? We have, uh, and we're just, we're not 15 million yet, but we have, uh, a, I don't know, over 100,000 Facebook, over 100,000 Twitter followers, and then we have our own social, ne social networking site. We can go on and download all your pictures. It's kind of a trip advisor type of site where you can talk about your travels and then we made a commitment to everyone who's on those that anything we do as far as promotions or lower fares or anything, we tell them first. Yeah. So it's relevant. You know, it, there's a reason to be on there because you know about a s new city announcement, you know about a, you know, a, a fare sale we're going to do, if we're going to do free companion tickets or something. They all know about it first and so it's, it's really growing and I think it makes people, you know, they're loyalists. You know, they're, they're part, you know, the, you know, the tipping point, you know, you, you, you know, talk about connectors and people who are mavens, and you know, I, you know, our job is to create as many. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think this is this is an interesting point because when I first went to New York, you know, I came off the turnip truck from Utah, and I'm starting <laughs> this new airline called JetBlue. We didn't have a name or anything, and the ad agency came to us and they said, you know, we're going to create your brand for you. We don't know your name, but you know, give us 175,000 a month, and we'll be you'll create your brand. And I said. You know, it's offensive to me because I, we're going to create our brand kind of one customer at a time. And you'll just put a little wrapping on it and make it look good. So I think, you know, you talk about brand and what you do with, you know, how it looks, but also it's how you react and how you deal with your customers. And that's really the important part. It's not, you know, it's, I think people get carried away and think all I have to do is make it look pretty and I'll have a great company. But it's day-to-day you know, -day customer interactions. We talk to each of our customers five times when they travel. We touch them five times and everyone has to be perfect. And then when they become kind of evangelists and they get on our site and they tell everybody and you know, we're, we're doing a, a viral thing where they sign people up for a frequent flyer program, they get points mm -hmm. for everyone that signs up. So all kinds of things. It's, it's huge in Brazil and it's something that we do a lot. But, but Guy, most of your brands look good anyway, right? Uh, they could look better. Yeah, they could, oh, they could look better. So, what do you recommend? Should they have Facebook pages? Should they tweet a well, lot to a lot of those people? Many tweet? different kinds of, of people. Um, you know, some don't do it at all, and some r really do it. And, For example, you know, you really have to be committed. Who's the biggest tweeter in your in your? Well, Ashton is is of course is, is really the you know I mean he doesn't just tweet it. He's he really understands. He's really part of the whole thing, and he he is he's out there educating himself on every single thing that's going on, how to how to you know how to bring social into all the many areas that he is excited about. Um, but there's a lot of artists. You know, Madonna's not going to sit there and and, and tweet. Um, and it's really a commitment. And if you make it, it's more power to you because you'll have that instant relationship. Um, but you really, it is a commitment. You can't do it and then walk away for a month and decide, hey, I'll, I'll check in again. It, it really, you won't, it won't have any sticky, stickiness to it. So it really is a commitment. It's a lifestyle commitment. And some people have people do it for them, um, which, um, you know, I think, I think if, you, you know, if you pay attention to it, you'll know it's, it's, it's not it's just coming in and it's not, it's not real, it's not genuine. Um, but for me, when we go on the road, I actually, I, I, I have a Twitter, and so, because Madonna's not doing it, so when we go on the road, uh, I will s put up photos every night and, and really, really connect with uh, the Madonna fans. And if there's f tickets left over, I'll say tweet, if you're at this place, this is before Foursquare. Are there tickets ever, ever left over from Madonna concert? You know, I may have some on me. Right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, know, you know the guy whose tweets to follow there, right? That's the sort of connectivity. Fans really need to, they really need to be, um, uh, I think music is, is probably better at it than anyone else, because uh, uh, there's so much new content. And uh, so really music is at the forefront of how to continually share information and do things. And, and honestly, if, if the artist today, if a new artist today doesn't do that, I don't know how they build up a, a business. You know, if you're not engaging through Facebook or through Twitter or you know, some way with your fans, there's just no other way to do it because the, 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 the money's dried up and there's no other way to get on radio or have money for a video or you know, there's no other marketing. Your marketing is you now. You need <laughs> to go out there and, and pitch yourself all day long or pitch what you're doing all day long. So we're running out of time, but we almost have. I'm going to ask one last question to all of you, and you have to answer it quickly. On a scale of 1 to 10, in this mind shift from traditional branding towards digital branding, and you think about the world out there with all the brands, 
Where do you think the world is on a scale of one to ten? Are they ready for it? Are they nine? Are they ready for the big digital mind shift? Are they at a five? Are they at a three? P? I think it depends what part of the world you live in. So I'd say I think the world is ready for it. So I'd give it a nine out of ten. And Coke? And I'd say Coke is still learning and on the journey. So we're probably closer to a six. Six. Mm -hmm. Laura? Depends on the target. Teen and youth today, ten. Um, it, it goes lower as you get older from there. I think the scary thing for marketers is what do you do 20 years from now when everybody is on this new platform? That's, that's really true. 20 years is a long time in internet. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it'll change how everything We'd have a few more Twitters, Facebook, YouTubes, Googles by then, right? I hope so. <laughs> Guy? Um, I would say that, that it's, it's not where will it be. I'd say that everyone just expects it to be. So I think that the expectation is out of 10, that everyone expects something new to be coming or for Steve Jobs to be every four months showing something brand new, a new way you can have people play live at your house without even having to see them. At a, they'll just show up, you know, Aerosmith is at your house playing live. And so that's, that, that people are expecting, I, th I think if it doesn't move fast, they'll go, what do you mean? Now you can only have one person and you, you know, we thought the whole audience would be here with me at my house. So, um, so the expectation I think is at a 10. And uh, preparedness? Preparedness. Um, Preparedness, I'd say, is out, is, is out of five. David? Uh, you know, our, our problem, I think we're, we're like an eight, nine, but, but the country is, you know, there's a, the, Brazil's very segmented, and only 35% of the people are connected. And those people that are connected pay 10 times um, more for their internet than people in New York pay. So you make a fifth as much money paying 10 times as much. So, you know, it, it, I think for the level, the, the cost of connection, and for the number of people that connected, Brazil's amazing, and it only has you know further to go, and so we're going to be ready for it when as they as this hundred million people of middle class move into the digital age. Well, perfect. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time. Thank, please join me in thanking my panel. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, guys. Thank you, David. Moving on to our next panel, um, hard. Uh, to move on after that um, really moving story. Thank you so much, Howard. Um, but uh, we have uh, some uh, very exciting uh, and important leaders who are going to speak to us. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, that President Vicente Fox of Mexico uh, is here. Please join me. President Fox, you here. Um, please sit down. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who is an expert in globalization, immigration, uh, policy, and education, and who is now a professor at New York University. Uh, President Fox, uh, people like to say that people need no introduction. It's actually true in this case. Um, as you all know, uh, he was a groundbreaking iconoclastic leader of Mexico, both in Mexican politics, the first opposition leader to be elected uh, since 1920, and incredibly important in, as well as domestic politics, in reshaping the North American continent and in reshaping Mexico's position in our continent. Uh, he has a lot in common with this audience as well, uh, because he is, Prior to his political career, he had a very glittering business career. Uh, I see uh, Beatrice nodding because he is from the Coca-Cola family. Uh, he was the head of Coca-Cola in Mexico and Latin America, so he speaks from that experience too. Uh, and I am particularly thrilled to have President Fox here because I think um, an elephant in the room in our whole conversations over the past two days really has been the fact that we are here in Arizona. And some of the Google organizers said to me, Google being a company uh, that likes to say they do no evil, uh, some of the organizers said to me that there was pushback from within Google. And people said, why are we going to Arizona? Uh, these people are doing bad things. Uh, President Fox has been quite outspoken, uh, I think uh, very bravely, about his views of uh, Arizona's new immigration laws. And I'd like to ask you to start there, President Fox. What, what do you think the impact of these laws is, and, and, and what have they done in terms of how the United States is seen in Mexico? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. 
Let me just briefly say that my life has been like a football game with four quarters. One was a student, then second quarter was with this marvelous global corporation, the Coca-Cola company, where I started as a route salesman. And in 10 years, I resigned to move to family business, being president uh, for all of Latin America. Then I was in family business for a quarter, another 15 years, and uh, enjoyed the difficulties, the struggling of every day to raise for the payroll on next uh, Friday. Very difficult to run small businesses. Then I moved to my third uh, quarter, which is uh, moving to politics, into the public sector. But coming to the case of migration, I think it's, it's a debate that is totally miscited here in the States, misguided, most of it coming from that very sad day of September the 11th, where fear spread out in this nation, and fear has been guiding decisions. Fear has made uh, to take the decision of building a wall when we should be building bridges to isolate, in a way, from the rest of the world when the world is more open than ever. And so uh, that's a key ingredient on the case of migration. Migration is an asset to any nation. My grandfather migrated from Cincinnati, Ohio, down into Mexico as a migrant without a penny in his pocket. He crossed deserts, mountains, rivers, borders, and he settled in Guanajuato in Mexico. And there he found his American dream. So migration is a two-way street. And uh, when, I, when I see this great nation, which I feel part of because of my grandfather, um, I don't see why this change in leadership, this change on going on the vanguard and challenging the world for openness, for growth, for equal opportunities to everybody, and now has backed up to enclose within itself. I think that the decision that has been taken in Arizona is totally wrong miscited because the first one that is going to pay the price for that move is the same state of Arizona. They have forgotten that Mexico is a partner, that we buy from this nation more products and services than what Italy, Germany, France, and Britain do together. We account for hundreds of thousands maybe millions of jobs for U.S. citizens because of the imports we make into Mexico. As partners, we're building prosperity. We're building competitiveness to our nations. We are protecting our jobs from the challenge coming from Asia, from China, from India. And we have to understand that we're partners and that as partners, we can build a much better future. And finally, the human side, just mentioned by Howard. I think the human side is a key ingredient in this issue, as well as in many others. In many others, as the same corporations that work global, and that they should, as we are proposing now, together with Georgetown University and the Gallup Corporation, that by the side of each CEO, chief executive officer, should be a CCO, a chief cultural officer, working not on the markets, but on the human side of development, working on ecology and protection of natural resources, working with the community, working to build up successful communities, successful societies, successful citizens, all over the world. 
So again, I think that we should be building bridges between our two great nations on instead of dividing through building walls. Which, by the way, those walls are being built by Mexicans also. <laughs> so you've just mentioned uh, business, President Fox. And when I talk to American business leaders, in general, they're very pro-immigration. Do you think that they have done a good enough job about raising their voices in the American political debate? Well, here we are, and I'm highly impressed of uh, having come to this meeting to see this vanguard of talent, of brains, of audacity, of innovation, as you all are. But we pretty frequently forget that human beings do their best in a scenarios of peace, of uh, prosperity, of humanity, a scenarios of a stability, and that's where we do our best. And that's what at Centro Fox we are doing, trying to build that kind of uh, economies, that kind of nations, that kind of societies where we human beings can do what we are discussing here. And governments really need to think about this and really need to think to the future and make sure that they build this kind of scenarios so that the whole world can move forward. I'd like to bring our friend Marcelo into the conversa on conversation. So Marcelo, you have studied immigration policy over time. Where, how does the debate right now fit into the American historical context? Is this, are, are people angrier about immigration now than they were in the past? Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here and to be a part of the, the conversation, and I'm especially delighted to share the platform with, uh, with President uh, Fox. As the President was speaking, I was reminded of the beautiful first line in Anna Karenina, all families are happy the same way, uh, but when it comes to immigration, all of the families of the post-industrial world are unhappy the same way, because we are caught. Hey, what about Canada, my country? I'm going to Toronto next week to do some cultural therapy for the things that are not working in Canada also. Uh, Canada does very, very well when it comes to immigration. But we're caught with an essential ambivalence. Um, you ask, how is what's going on today different from what happened in American history maybe 100, 150 years ago when in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a massive wave of migration, a wave of migration that is greater than today's migration wave, was fundamentally transforming the nation. That wave of migration created great anxieties, great concerns. We love immigration looking backwards. We love to narrate the stories of our ancestors who, against fantastic odds, came to uh, emerge as engaged citizens who really built our country. In the here and now, immigration has always generated pushback. A hundred year, hundred years ago, it was uh, there were deep anxieties, deep concerns over whether Eastern Europeans could be integrated into American society, whether the Irish and the Italians could become um, members of a family that uh, had been founded by earlier waves of uh, English Protestant uh, immigrants. Today, the, the, Again, serious anti-Semitism, serious anti-Catholic sentiment was at the very, very center. Today... Do you think that's comparable to the attitude towards Muslims today? Uh, well, I think 9-11 changed everything, and, and it's important 
not to make facile historical analogies that really don't work. The point that I do want to make is that in the, in the uh, United, that was elegant, in the it? United he, States, he skated around there very in, well. In done the United that. States Supreme Court today, uh, there are no Protestants. All members of the Supreme Court today are the descendants of those Catholics and those Jews that were once imagined as unassimilable, uh, as um, uh, an impossible group to bring into the family of the nation. Looking backward, all of this becomes very obvious, very ridiculous. What's important to think in the 21st century is how the story of immigration has become the human face of a global interconnected world. You can't have integrated economies. You can't have integrated uh, communications. You can't have integrated technologies without having integrated demographies. And this is what every country today in the high income world is experiencing. Very, very profound transformations moving forward as a function of the dynamics that the global integration of our economies and societies is generating tremendous demographic changes. There's one important fact, though, and one big difference from this previous big wave of immigration that you're talking about. I sometimes find myself on talk shows uh, talking about this, and one of the people I'm sometimes on talk shows with is Pat Buchanan. And one of the lines that he likes to bring up is he says, these people all broke the law. These are 11 million lawbreakers who are here. And surely we as a country have the right to enforce our laws. What's the answer to that? Can you just say, well, it's like an interconnected global economy? Well, I think that um, we're less than 5% of the global population today. We probably have roughly 20% of all unauthorized immigrants worldwide. This clearly does not work. We, the United States. The United States, less than 5% of the world's population today has probably about 20% of all illegal immigrants on Earth. This is clearly not working. It doesn't work for the five million children who woke up this morning in our country. Four million of these children are citizen children. Still, we may one day uh, change the 14th Amendment. That's not likely to happen soon. But we have four million children, citizen children, who get up, get into buses, go to schools, and they don't know what will happen to their parents. They don't know if their parents are going to be there, are going to be deported. Last year, the United States deported 395,000 people to countries like Mexico, but throughout, uh, throughout the world. So you wrote that very nice article about the girl in the school visited by Mrs. Obama. Correct. Yes, so here we have an example of a citizen child asking the first lady, but my mommy's afraid, uh, you know? She doesn't know when she's gonna get deported or what's going to happen uh, to her. So clearly, nobody is for illegal immigration. Illegal immigration hurts the families. Illegal immigration cheapens the value of citizenship. Illegal immigration bears the emperor. It, 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 it performs all of the frustrations we have with a governmental architecture that is not working. Sí. Yes, I fully agree with that. And uh, that's why the call is for Congress, because we're talking a federal issue here. And the way that issue has been sitting dormant at US Congress has permitted different states to come with different regulations or different laws which really is because of the empty space that has been left out by federal government. But more so, let me tell you a concept here that I listened to Colin Powell very recently at the Bohemian Grove in San Francisco, California. Are you allowed to tell us what happens at the <laughs> Bohemian Grove? Of course. <laughs> no. And uh, what he said is this nation is missed sighted and it's not 
doing the work that he should be doing when it's not letting my minorities come into schools, minorities uh, have open opportunities equal to anybody else, because he says 25 years from now, minorities will be majorities in this nation. They're going to be running this nation. And how come you deprive them from going to school or this society is not worried enough to prepare them for that future that is coming? The statistics and the population figures show that pretty soon we'll have in California a Mexican governor. And we might be getting back part of our territory. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> See, he was just checking if you're listening. <laughs> I'm going to ask President Fox one more question. And please, um, you have a chance to ask him one question. This is a historic opportunity to ask a historic leader something. So I want a little more energy than we had with Howard. I know Howard was sort of melancholy. It, it was hard to interrogate him. But uh, please, come on. And I'm going to ask a quick uh, question while people get up their nerve, innovative Googlers that you are. Um, the follow-up is, what about Mexico's responsibility in all of this? There, there's obviously been a lot of overheated rhetoric here, but one of the things you hear Total. a lot of coming out of Arizona is Mexican drug violence being exported into the Total United States. Total responsibility. And there is no obligation to this nation to act different than what it's been doing. That's why I'm calling this miscited. It's not treating fair your partner. It's not seeing at the future of how your economy will be competitive. It's not looking at who is going to be harvesting the apples in Washington State, who is going to be harvesting the agricultural fields of California, who is going to be building the buildings in Las Vegas or anywhere else. Uh, so it's, it's just a way to see this and an invitation to use talent, to use intelligence, like leaders do, like you use. And by the way, at Central Fox, we understand leadership as something that every single human being has within. We are all leaders. We're leaders all the time of our life. And we're leaders in any activity that we choose to work upon in our lives. The big problem most everywhere, is that many of us don't go within ourselves, don't learn about our leadership, don't uh, learn about our capacities, and do not commit ourselves. So you don't create leaders. We're all leaders. And what you do is to facilitate that everybody makes this exercise and come up with that strong, passionate, compassionate leadership and big aspirations for heroic goals. That is what we should all do, like that big graph there. That's as far, and maybe not even that far, that every single human being can reach. If you only discover your leadership, if you only are aware of the power that we all have within. And renewal, renewal, which we've been hearing all these magnificent stories here, Dipra Chopak puts it very simple. Gift yourself with five minutes of reflection every day. And then maybe you don't need the call of cancer that Lace had. Maybe you don't need the September 11th to react with your own corporation and with your own humanity. If you commence every day, on this new beginning, and you work new ideas to the future, you can every day be doing better things, great things, heroic things. OK, let's hear from some of the leaders here with their questions, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I am an Austrian citizen, and I live in Mexico. I immigrated there, and I just wanted to say I'm very happy that there are no walls at any border. Otherwise, I would not be there. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think, uh, President Fox, uh, what did trigger the drug war in Mexico, and how long do the citizens have to wait until this is going to be come to a, not to an end, but to a uh, livable situation? Yeah. 
Well, with all respect, uh, we in Mexico just happen to be in between the huge, the mammoth U.S. market of drug consumption and the countries that produce it down south, the Venezuelas, the Colombias, the Bolivias. And we're paying the price because one president, whose name is Felipe Calderón, decided that he must cut the supply of drugs to this nation and that he must cut the supply of drugs to our youth in Mexico. And then we're in this war that is not our drugs, our war, because the money to nourish that war is coming from this market, this huge consumer market. Billions of US dollars come down south every year. And the weapons, the ammunition, each and every one of those comes from this nation down to Mexico. So what's the so answer? Do it's a joint responsibility. We have to work together. That's why I'm totally for depenalizing not only drug consumption, but drug production, drug distribution, and the selling of drugs. I think that we must separate. Legalizing? Yes. How far? Legalizing? Total. Absolutely total. At the very end, it's our own responsibility of the users, of the consumers. I mean, you don't limit the consumer to get Coca-Cola because it has caffeine. <laughs> She's given the Coca-Cola. That's going to be the I mean, headline, Beatrice. <laughs> Coca-Cola is the same as the, drugs and should be legal. Nations, <laughs> the nations that have taken this step have suffered no increase in drug consumption, like Holland. Or this nation, when it finally ended up the prohibition back in the 20s of last century, you ended up with the capos and with the crime that extended in the area of Chicago. So prohibitions don't work. At the very end, it's the consumer. It's the user of drugs that has to react, has to protect his own health, has to be pretty aware of the harm that he's doing to himself. And the family education and the school system education. Imagine a world where you have drugs that are depenalized and that are legal and that you tax them with a 1,000% over and above the price cost. Then you are on a market, and the, mon the money you can raise there, it would be more than enough to reduce drug consumption, like societies in this nation or in Mexico have been able to reduce smoking and liberated many, many people that were to die. In the case of Mexico, there is not more than 1,000 people that die for overdoses. And this war has costed in the last four years 28,000 people killed, or if we take cigarettes, or if we take alcohol, it's tens of thousands of people that die for that. Why is a nation paying such a high cost on tourism, on investment, on talent that is living the country to protect that 1,000? I mean, let's leave it to them to decide whether they would consume or not. And finally, I would take out the army, bring it back to their headquarters, and use police on instead, because there's a lot of problems with the presence of the army on the streets. A lot of human rights violations, a lot of uh, non-due judiciary process that every citizen deserves. So we must do some changes, we must think like the guys that passed through this stage this morning, innovation, new ideas, new ways to confront this problem. We have to think laterally and go beyond this war that we're faced with right now. Okay, well, uh, our time has come to an end. We've had a red light for a few minutes, but uh, I uh, introduced yes. President Fox as an innovative and iconoclastic leader, and I think he has certainly lived up to that billing in the conversation here. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Marcelo, for helping us to understand in a broader context these very heated issues. Um, great pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very much. That's and I think, Martha, yeah. my partner. Oh, uh, yeah, and, and Mrs. Fox is here with us also. She's my partner.
<laughs> my love. Now, Nikesh. Thank you, President Fox. Uh, from one innovative, iconoclastic leader to another two, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Ivan Seidenberg, Chairman and CEO of Verizon. Ivan started his career 40 years ago as a cable splicer's assistant at Verizon, and today he runs a very large business and probably responsible for many of the high-speed internet services on my phone and in my house. Uh, Ivan, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And of course, uh, Eric Schmidt, our Chairman and CEO, who needs no introduction. Thank you very much, Nikesh. Thank you, Ivan. The, uh, because of the pressure of time, I think what we'll do is we'll just combine our session and then you can help me give my final speech, since sure. we sort of agree on everything, don't we? Yeah, we do. We do. You see? Mm -hmm. Let's start with... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> let's, let's, <laughs> let's start with... What I like about Ivan is he's a very straightforward guy. He started off as a, literally a lineman, a, a splicer, right. um, and has risen to run one of the most important companies in the world, and certainly a company that is crucial to everything we're trying to achieve. And I think it'd be interesting to tell first a little bit how, how I met Ivan. Ivan decided to visit Google. And he just shows up by himself, wandering through the building, right? Interesting. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, this is interesting. A very curious man. And at the time, there was tremendous tension between my side of the world and the telcos. And we, were, we had a nice meeting. We were fairly, I was fairly skeptical of some of the things that he said, and especially about openness and so forth. And then uh, a set of his executives, including Lowell Lo McAdam, actually decided to announce commitments to openness. And I said, like, this is not really going to happen, is it? And they did, and they delivered. Uh, and then a while later, it turns out that they got very interested in Android. And they said, you know, not only are we going to adopt Android, but we're going to put a lot of marketing money behind it. And I said, eh, we'll see. I finally now believe the central essence of Verizon is that they actually do what, they're going to, what they say they're going to do, which I suspect is your leadership style. Well, thank you. No, we try. When, uh, can, for, to start with, can you talk a little bit about just what is the scale of Verizon? Right? How many people, what's the revenue, where does the revenue come from? You know, th th there's a stereotype that somehow all of your revenue comes from the old business, not the new business. So what if this is true? What's false? Okay, so the quick elevator speeches were $110 billion. Um, about 80 is wireless. About um, 15 or 20 is the former MCI that we acquired. So in uh, hindsight, the old telco that you all maybe remember is 10 or 15% of a whole it's company. It's that small. Yeah. And I assume it's getting right. smaller. Yeah, it represents a bigger part of our cost structure, but in terms of revenue, it's... Uh, so you it's have high it. cost, declining revenue there. Right. Exactly. So don't you have a problem getting dealing with all those people and trying to get them over? Yeah, so we're 220,000 people. Uh, Sorry, could you repeat that? 220,000. 220,000 employees. Right. And they were formed, of course, from the union of all these RBOX. Correct. And those of you who are not familiar with the storied history of the telcos, um, all of these executives worked for AT&T. Then Judge Green b uh, broke up AT&T into seven Arbox uh, and left AT&T around. Eventually, the Arbox swallowed up each other, leaving two largely successor ones. And one of them sw swallowed up AT&T and renamed itself. Is that a rough summary of your history? That's good. I, I think that for this audience, though, there's one or two little facts that you might be interested in. Probably 50% of our company were, has worked for us for less than seven years. So we're basically a new business. So we have. We're a legacy corporate structure. Uh, we've renamed ourselves 10 years ago, but uh, I think the issue we have a, a very new workforce. Mm -hmm. And um, probably 60 to 70% of all our revenues have been generated in the last three or four years. Wireless was zero revenues um, 20 years ago. In, in 2001, it was about eight or nine billion, and now it's 80. So, we consider ourselves much more of a, a new age business than probably people categorize us. In. And I'm shocked because this next generation doesn't seem to have home phones. They seem to actually just have cell phones. 25% of people cut the cord on their, their, on yeah, their home phone. That's an amazing statistic. Right. How many of those people are now moving to what we would think of as smartphones and powerful wireless data plans and so forth? Well, if you look at smartphones uh, right now, 60% of every sale, all the sales we make today are smartphones. If you look at our base, we're about 20, a little over 20% of our base is smartphones. AT&T's base, about 40% of their base is uh, smartphones because of the, their iPhone uh, success. So the issue is, our view, 70% of people will have a, a smartphone within three or four years. So it's very soon. Right. Um, why did you make the decision to become open, open standards, all of that, when nobody else did? You asked me. 
That's very kind of you. I suspect there were good reasons as well. What, the real reason? Yes, the real reason. No, it's very simple. I think when you, our job is to find growth. Okay. And so when you think about growth, you know, we inject a lot of our uh, capital into building networks that have more reach, more bandwidth, more scope, more functionality. And um, I think you globalize and openness creates growth. So I, I think that, you know, that people tend to look at existing institutions as if uh, openness becomes a, a sort of a, um, uh, a detractor to generating growth, but it's just the opposite. And so that as the system gets bigger, as software develops, as applications develops, as the consumer changes, the only way you can sort of keep yourself growing with the market is you gotta change some things. So for us, it's investment in, in three things. It's investment in our core network, because at heart we're all we're kind of sort of engineers. We like to be engineers. Uh, the second is our brand. We spend a lot of money on our brand. And the third thing is our distribution. So like, we're one of the, the stores. Few, yeah, right. We're one of the few companies that actually owns all our stores. Mm -hmm. So we pride ourselves on having 2,200 stores. And, and uh, if you go into our stores, there's an experience that goes with that. So those three things. And then, uh, Eric, what you do is you take with that the mentality of openness, machine to machine connections, you know, component parts to component parts, um, and you know all the rest, everybody here understands that, but services and applications, um, you win, we win, so, uh, so. So the only time I've ever seen you get mad is when I mentioned Title I regulation. You don't want, to, you want me to get mad now? Is I just want you to explain what it means and why, you said it was a nuclear issue. Well, you it, use stronger words than that. Yeah, no, in a nutshell, here's the kind of way we see it, so. I mean, you've been regulated. Well, but you know, we have spent close to $100 billion of, of investor capital to change our company, and yet we have people in Washington that want to hold on to us as if we look the same as we did 25 years ago. Um, th to some of that, we thought Google felt that way about us, and, and so we, we used to have very heated discussions, but it's pretty simple to us. Um, we are completely on the side of the public internet should be open. We've never behaved any differently. We've never viewed the issue any differently than that. But, but for us to invest money into 4G networks and 5G networks, for us to invest in fiber optics to, to the home, there has to be a component of that network that is open to innovation, that where you can create different packages. And, and, and you're concerned that the right. FCC now is going to regulate? Well, the, the FCC, just to, to put it put into effect, would take, Title II is their label for old style utility regulation. So what they wanted to do is because they lost the case on the BitTorrent with um, uh, Comcast. You're all familiar with that? I assume you are. Okay, so what, what happened there very quickly is that Comcast sort of slowed down the bits because they didn't have enough capacity and that turned out to be a big thing and the FCC uh, tried to sue them and they lost in court because they didn't have jurisdiction. So the solution to that was to drag everybody into an old style regulation. Our view is when you do that, risk capital goes someplace else, you end up with rules you don't need and you basically create a situation where you try to take a network asset like ours, an infrastructure piece, and turn it into a public asset or a public utility. And what will happen is what happens in every other country in the world when the government runs the postal office or runs the telecommunication system, you're always gonna be behind the curve. So the bottom line is we've said, where well, you need enforcement, you need rules, we're there. But we don't want people managing our risk capital. So w changing subject for a sec, most people believe your network is the fastest, at least the, certainly the broadest fastest in America. Um, you've certainly not had the problems that AT&T has had on your network, mm -hmm. and you have 4G LTE coming. Right. So take us through that. Uh, my understanding is that that is an immense amount of capital, which is at, very much at risk. Right. right. You're depending upon applications. When does it come out? What are, wh how yeah. committed are you to this? How fundamental is it? Mm. Okay. So, so here's the story. So really quickly, so you get a sense of sort of mindset. So 10 years ago, Everybody said the network is a commodity. Anybody can build a network. We don't believe that. So the first execution of what we try to do different was, can you hear me now? Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody remembers that. It was our way of saying, wait, the network is not a commodity. Yeah. 
So we then went from 1G to 2G to 3G. Every time you go from one generation to the next, you get better compression, you basically increase speeds by about 30, 35%. So here we are with the 3G network, um, nationwide 3G network, CDMA based, as, as you know. Um, you're getting one and a half megabits, 1.8 megabits per second. And then the 4G technology comes along, it's eight to 10 megabits per second. So here we are saying, with eight to 10 megabits per second, we can transmit high definition video. So we made a decision, we would stop building out our 3G network and convert all of that capital to 4G. Okay. We were criticized for that because the device manufacturers, the whole system was geared to, toward GSM, the European standard, and it was geared to a 3G model. So we had to get out in front of the market by saying we would build a 4G network and we needed to find a couple of partners that would take a risk with us. This is where Eric and Google were very visionary about this. They didn't sort of agree with our business plan, but they said, if this works, this is a way for Google to jumpstart. Because remember, be honest about it, Apple owned the smartphone market. AT&T did an exclusive deal. We held our own all this time, but now 4G changes the game. And, and define 4G for this audience again. 4G is just a sort of a, a, a carrier's model. It's a, Fourth generation, it's, just, it's, a, it's an overlay network on top of the existing tower structures. So everything still works. Everything still works. Everything's backward compatible. So uh, when, you, when we cut over 4G, if you buy a new 4G device, it'll be backward compatible with, with uh, the existing network. Now, from an infrastructure guy, here's um, some interesting tidbits. So the speed is almost eight times 3G in, on a throughput, average throughput basis. Latency is four times what it is on 3G, meaning delay is four times better. Cost is four to six times better for us. We could not figure out why everybody didn't do this. Mm -hmm. And what happened was we announced, everybody said it's not gonna work, it's gonna take too long to do it. Everybody's now announced. Okay. So we'll be in the market. So where we are, Eric, is um, um, if you can keep a secret, I'll tell you the dates, you know, so um, <laughs> somehow in, uh, the fourth quarter of this year, our network is already up and working. It's working at 100 uh, million population locations, 32 major markets, 50 or so major airports around the country. It's working right now. We're doing all of the testing, the protocol. Um, when we cut over a network, we don't cut over one tower and say we're in business. We wait until- Are you telling me that it's already there and you just haven't turned it on? Yeah, you gotta get rid of that Blackberry you're using because you'd find out how much good, how much better this is. <laughs> but, but the issue is it's working. So what will happen is when we announce um, it's up and running, that's when people will be able to buy 4G devices, okay? And so the first set of things that will come out, we hope will be some tablets. And you've probably heard from Sanjay and some others, there, there are some companies that are focusing on 4G tablets. Amazingly robust and interesting. So this is devices. a tablet that's got 10 megabits going to it. It's with got- With video and the, everything. It's got a lot of stuff. I mean, I carry a tablet in my bag and it's got some amazing things on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's lots of applications. It's not just entertainment. It's just so many interesting things. Then the other thing is there'll be some um, air cards. Obviously, people will use that for their, their applications. And what we'll start to see are devices being rolled out. So you'll, you'll see a, a slow build up. By the time you get to the end of the first quarter, the middle of the next year, you'll start to see a choice of devices. And then all the carriers will start to uh, move. And then what we hope will be is that the world will move to the 4G standard. Why is this important to us? You know, 70% of the world is on GSM. So we have done as well as we're gonna do with our wireless business. So growth said we wanted to reach the whole world. And so we had to move to a global standard, which is now 4G. And you know, one of the things behind the scenes, Eric, that we've always worked on is, like you do this, our, our people didn't just roll out 4G, but we worked hard at all the standards bodies to make sure that we had consistency so, across so, the So basically, world. at the end of this year, we're gonna have a network which is eight times faster, four times better latency, and costs you less to run and build. Right. Sounds like a pretty good deal to You me. might have to move to one of those 32 cities, but the other cities- Well, like, which, like what's the list of cities? Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you that if you want, but you can figure it out. <laughs> but no, let me just talk about that, so- well, Let's start with New York, San Francisco, LA. Yeah, right, you, you can figure those out. But here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> but, but here's where we are, though. 
So we cut over 32, and then the day we cut over, 24 months later, we're 90% of the country. Okay. So we will deploy every month there will be a cut over someplace in the country. In that right. su su subsequent. So in the space of 34 months, we will be 94 or 5% deployed before G around the country. So we think that's a huge deal. So for all of you who sort of work with Google, write applications, um, you've got to think differently about the kind of applications and consumer demand that will take advantage of what this kind of capability offers. I want to come back to that in a sec. Um, let me ask you my last question. Because we're compressing things, what I'm not going to do is also give my comments, uh, and Ivan, again, can help a little bit. But I have one final question for you. Um, you're quite on the record about your view of this administration and their business policies. Um, I think people would be interested in your criticisms and what you would do differently. Uh, my observation is that the government is now stuck until January, so it doesn't matter what you and I say, because nothing's going to happen. What do you really think is going on? Well, look, I, I, for those of you who don't know, I, I serve as the chairman of the Business Roundtable. So the Business Which Roundtable. Which is the biggest collection of, of business executives. Right. So it's a, it's a CEO principled only organization, so 200 companies. So. So um, I get more probably visibility than I, I should get with, with that. So everything I say carries with it um, dual uh, capabilities on this. But here's what I would say. I think that the issue to us in the business community is the, is the administration, it's not the president, it's the entire government's ability to operationalize the ideas that were the foundation of this president getting elected and converting them into things that need to work every day. So it's not a disagreement that we want to spread the wealth. It's not a disagreement we want people to have health care. It's not a disagreement that the banks need to be restructured. Well, in my judgment, what's happened is that the president and the White House have good ideas, but when the organs of government, like the Congress and all the, the cabinet agencies, start writing laws, they write the laws that they used to think were good in 1980. Mm -hmm. And they have forgotten that the world is going forward from 2010. This is a really difficult issue because it gets political, it, 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 it gets personal, and so we're very frustrated. So let me give you an example. So uh, just one example. So this financial regulatory bill that was just written, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you know this. The bill is 2,400 pages long. There are a thousand regulations. Now, okay, we needed some controls. I, nobody disagrees. We work with the administration on those things. But when the staffs and the bureaucracies and the vested interest got a hold of it, there's, a, there's going to be 150 proceedings that won't get resolved for another two or three years. So the business community is really concerned about the embedded costs that are getting put into doing business in the U.S. that are not necessary. So, am I criticizing the president? No. But the organs of government need a little adult supervision on this issue so we can fix this, okay? And, and I've, told it, I've told this to the White House, so it's not that we don't, and we get into these discussions. And I, we have examples after examples. But uh, is there a head in the right place? Sure, I mean, we, we want to help fix that. Now, last thing, the, so why is there so much, um, if you look at the economy, last point, the, Macro numbers look terrible, you know, unemployment, demand, that kind of thing. The micro numbers don't look as bad. Your company is strong, our company is strong, a lot of companies are strong. So what's happening is there's a huge resistance to deploying risk capital, okay? And that is because of all the uncertainty that's buried inside of the, um, the economy. And I think we need, to, we need to fix that. America needs to take the lead on that, yeah. okay? So, so I think it's a healthy debate. I think um, the business community is obligated to speak out. We become targets of the media, the press, and, you know, and the answer is, so be it. You know? Right, comes with the job. Yeah, I think our employees, I, I know this. You take my company, 220,000 people, average salary is $60,000, $65,000, guaranteed our company is overwhelmingly democratic, right? But when they come into town hall meetings and they talk to me about, well, what's the gap? They get it. They get it because they know we're going to create the jobs. Business is going to create the jobs, not government. So I think the issue we have to figure out is how to take the, the policies of the, the administration and operationalize them so that it creates real organic wealth for the country. 
Well, thank you, thank you for that. What I'd like to do is to talk for a few minutes about what I think, uh, and Ivan's comments I think are a perfectly good step up to this point, and maybe a couple questions and, and finish up. Uh, I've been looking at what does all of this mean for all of us, and I Ivan said some sort of amazing things. He said that basically by roughly the end of this year, 32 cities, which are gonna give you the precise list fairly right. soon, right. are gonna have 10 megabits as you guys are walking around, and all you need to do is buy a, 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 new, uh, a new card for your computer or a new iPad or what have you. Uh, and this is a phenomenal achievement on their part. And the neat thing is it's good business for them. Lower costs, better use of capital, and so forth. So it's a win-win. Absolutely. And this is what technology means. So what, what's the bigger picture? And I've been thinking about that for a while. And, and I, let me offer you a model, uh, which I'm gonna call sort of augmented humanity, for lack of a better term. The notion that People are good at some set of things, and computers are good at some things of things. And we're now actually getting to the point where computers will be very good at the things that we're no good at, and we're very good at the things that they're no good at. And it's the sum of the two, when we interact with each other, that very, very interesting things are gonna have, making us all sort of smarter and quicker. And think of these computers, and I mean this in the broadest sense of computing, as a new set of di digital senses. And we've always been defined by our use of tools, right, as, a, as, a com as, a, as, a, as citizens, right, as humans. So let me offer you a basic theory that, I'll call it the Google happiness theory, the computers are there to serve us, not the other way around. And I know this is a shock, but the fact of the matter is computers are supposed to just work, right? And all that fiddling that you do, right, we really need to get to the point where they just know what to do. Um, and, and from my perspective, Google equals search becomes Google equals information that you need to know, information that makes your life better. And information here means more than just facts, right? Entertainment, we project things, we can instrument the world in some ways that are very powerful. And so what's interesting is the combination of the vision that Ivan outlined and what Google's doing is sort of a pervasive, a pervasive model of information everywhere. And, and you know, Bill Gates talked about this a long time ago. In 1990, he called, talked about inf all the world's information at your fingertips. It's taken us 20 years to get to this point with different technologies, but it's the correct thing. What to, and think of it as what to look for, how to spend my time. Um, and what's interesting is you sit there and you go, well, isn't that kind of obvious? But think about it. There's been this explosion of data, right? It gives you a headache. You can't figure out what to do. You're gonna be better off if tools are built that can actually help you decide how to spend your time on the information that matters because the information overload will give you a headache. Um, and at the rate at which this is going with his network and all the people who are publishing new information, I don't think there's any other way we're gonna be able to cope. And the other thing, the other implication that it has, that it has, has to do with the way devices work. So a music player going forward will be connected to the cloud. Because historically, music players had stored music, but now they'll have not only the stored music, but they'll also have the local music as you move along. It makes sense that all of a sudden, every one of them will be able to query both the local environment as well as whatever they were programmed. And search, we may be able to get to the point, and we hope to, where the query, you know, what is the weather in my hometown? The real query you were asking is, should I wear a raincoat? or do I need to water the plants? That's what you meant. And the artificial intelligence technology that is being invented by companies like Google and others will allow us to get at least somewhere to that point, knowing a little bit more about you again with your permission. Um, so what's happening is the tech underlying technology trends, which again you outlined so well, are fundamentally about mobile first. I will tell you that the smartest and most capable engineers in the world are now working on these powerful devices. And by the way, when you get your LTE network done, can you imagine how exciting it is to have 10 megabits reliably to these both tablets, right. uh, phones, tablets and phones to start with, and then desktops eventually? Lots and lots of telcos, by the way, Ivan, will be giving out free devices because it'll make sense, they'll sign up for contracts, and you'll actually be able to change the entire computing model so people can go to your store or you know, what have you, get this thing in, it just works. Uh, the network computing number, uh, things, which again, you've outlined, is really phenomenal, the scale at which it, and it has all sorts of implications. Um, if your children are awake, they're probably online. It's a frightening thought. Um, this technology is to the point where we can stream live video now to pretty much any device in most of the Western world. We, we've worked through the complexity and the pricing and the other issues through good engineering that people have done. And more importantly, at the, in the back, we have these supercomputers. Google, Google builds them, others do this as well. So an example would be last week we did a demonstration of the following, picked up your Nexus One Android phone, somebody spoke to it in English, and then the answer came back in German. 
Now, I have talked to 20 years that this would be possible. Now, technically, how did this work? Well, the phone simply collects your voice, digitizes it, sends it to the servers, which are somewhere in the cloud, probably not in the country, but somewhere else. That voice is, is turned into text. The text is translated into the other language, in this case, English to German. Um, the, and then the answer comes back in German. It's converted back into the other language, goes to text, and so forth. That's done by a 1,000 computers that you never knew were doing it. And it's done in less than a half a second, which we view as a very long time. To me, that is the ultimate statement of something that people can't do that computers will be able to do on Moss. And there are many, many such examples. So if you think about it, our goal is to let people understand things very, very quickly and understand them, just be fast. Google Instant, which people here are well aware of. Why do we do that? It's faster. It ultimately leads to more queries, we think. But we fundamentally know that you get your answer just that much faster. And you go, now oh, come on. Are you telling me that it's that much faster because I didn't have to type as many characters? Yeah. Yeah, that, that extra typing took time. And when you've got a billion people, you add up all that extra typing, and it's a lot of people's time, and time, time, people, time, time matters. So what I want is information that is both accurate and timely, fast and easy to consume, and across all the devices in a uniform way. And we're building all of that technology. The technical aspects are personalization, AI sharing, local information, identity, deep indexing, ad system targeting, automatic translation, voice and photo recognition, we have all sorts of platform plays, which you've heard about, uh, et cetera. But we're thinking a lot about what does this mean. So let me end my, my hopefully brief comments by talking about, well, first place, I, before I finish that, I want to say this does not come at, without a cost. And Google, I think, today uh, is seen very much as a disruptor. Uh, we're not exactly excited about that, but the fact of the matter, it is, it is true. We're a disruptor fundamentally because we uh, we do things that are technologically challenging, that really do change, uh, change assumptions. We do them at scale um, in the same way that, that you do them at scale, which I think is an important aspect. It's hard to do things at scale. Um, and the third is that we play in the information markets, and people have a lot of opinions about information. Um, and people disagree over information, and people, and people fight over what the rules are about that. So if I were to give you a sort of new view of the future, I would offer some things. You're never lost. Interesting. Have you been lost recently? Not if you have one of these digital devices. You're never lost. It's very strange. I used to get lost. I never get lost anymore. We can position you down to the foot, even eventually the inch. Your car should be self-driving. It's clearly going to drive better than you, you are. Now, you'll want to have a button to disconnect it if there's a softer bug. But if you think about it, cars kill 30,000 people a year. It's a pretty serious issue, especially when you're drunk. Right? Wouldn't it be better if the car just drove? And it had a button, take me home, because I'm not really quite sure where I am. Um, I'm not trying to be joke about something very serious, but the fact of the matter is it's crazy that we let humans drive these dangerous vehicles. Computers should do it. We have the technology to do that. It's clearly coming in, certainly in our lifetimes. And this explosion of real-time telemetry and data feeds has a lot of implications. Um, you and your friends know where you are. So does the government, by the way, which is a separate discussion. Um, Google Earth, Google Maps, all of that. People who love the Earth, which I hope is all of us, can love it even more. You can find out what's really going on. As I said, all the world's information is at your fingertips. Everybody speaks your language. You can know what people are doing, thinking, feeling, and people can remember. And, and this explosion in real-time information is, in fact, a search problem, which, of course, is what we're good at. But the question that we want to ask is, what exactly among all of this incredible amount of information that we're getting uh, should I pay attention to right now? Now, you're never lonely or bored. If you're lonely, you have this device that will connect you to your friends. And if you're bored, you have this infinite amount of information learning. It's like going to a bookstore and realizing you can never read all the books, except it's so much more infinitely large, larger than a bookstore. And you know, television, because of things like Google, Google TV, and um, you guys are looking at this. All, everybody else is trying to figure out what to do about this merger of television and the internet. Lots of very interesting ideas. Um, it's interesting that television has largely been replaced by the internet as the world's greatest time waster. What do you think people are doing on the internet? They're wasting their time just like they did on television, right? So we're proud to be part of that because we, you know, but it's fundamentally happening. And trust me, there's a lot more to waste your time about. Um, entertainment of games and, and uh, movies and short videos is ubiquitous. We suggest the new, next video. I was shocked that 
YouTube has more than two billion plays a day, 24 hours of YouTube videos uploaded every minute. I mean, this is very disturbing. Think about the amount of time that we're consuming. Um, and of course, that number is growing quite ra rapidly. Your friends are always around you. you know, you're, they're always online. There's always somebody for you to speak with. Your friends may Google better, right? Because the computer learns. The computer is better because the humans teach it in the same way that the humans are better because the computer remembers. Um, and what I like about this, and it's true of the things you talked about, is that this is not about the elite. When I was growing up, the information markets were fundamentally about the elite. A small group of people who had a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of control. These technologies are fundamentally democratic, and I mean that in the broadest possible sense of, of access. Um, there are roughly 800 million smartphones on the order of uh, 1 billion smartphones plus and coming fairly quickly. Your numbers would say, if I do it in my head, even faster, and I, I want you to be right. Uh, and of course, connected to the supercomputer. Um, and this notion of these new applications, and I think the iPad has really shown, shown us a very good model. These applications that just work, I think, show us a path for all these new devices. And of course, that'll be true on everybody else's way. So, so ultimately, what happens is computers become, they do what we're not good at. They make lists, they remember things, and they keep memories of what we do. And what we do is we help you take that information and try to figure out what you want to do. And in this model, again, this is all with your permission and so forth, we can really help you live a much fuller life. And you really can both enjoy yourself and, and feel like you are really at the center of the, center of the world. Uh, what I like about this is that we can suggest where you sh should go for dinner. We can even suggest what you should worry about. There's lots of information that we have now. So the context for this, just to finish, is for you to think about uh, computers and humans working together to solve problems that neither can solve alone, which I think is the most, most profound way of saying it. And it's not about not doing evil, it's about being committed to doing good, right? But using this technology to, in fact, improve the lot of everybody. Um, there's a quote from William Gibson in the New York Times last week. Google has made of us a sort of coral reef of human minds and their products, the stuff of poetry, I thought. Um, people want more time for their, for their friends, for their lives, and so forth, and I think we can make a significant contribution to that if we get the products right. Um, so thank you, and I think thank you, th thank you all for, for you. that. Um, what I wanted to do just to, f to, to finish is to say thank you to the teams that put this event together, Lorraine and her whole team. Could we have a round of applause for all of them? Um, based, on, based on the hallway feedback, uh, the feedback from dinner last night, this tone of optimism, with the exception of a number of our friendly economists, um, all worked very well. I think the call to action about education, let's just say the unique humor of Ted Turner, uh, the sum of all of this, I think, was an extraordinary event. I think the sense, the feedback from you all is that we should do this again, and so I'm looking forward to do th doing this in the future. Are there comments or questions for Ivan and me for a few minutes before we, we finish up? We have a, a few minutes. Yes, go ahead. Can you ask the uh, iPhone on Verizon question? Ah, the iPhone on Verizon question, Ivan. <laughs> When will you have the iPhone on Verizon? He want, he's a Verizon user and he cannot have an iPhone. Yeah. So what I would say is this. I think that um, it shouldn't surprise anybody to think that um, all the manufacturers are gearing themselves up to develop a 4G smartphone. Um, I, mean, I think that's where I would be on it. Um, anything else that Apple does, you know, they don't tell anybody. So I, I think at this point, though, we're excited that we'll have um, a full range of devices on 4G. Now, but the point I would make, though, is that um, I think this network is not conducive to just doing what you always did. I think people will have to make a quantum leap and find brand new applications for it. So um, what I'm thinking is Google, uh, you're going to find Motorola, you're going to find all these companies are going to make um, Apple work um, at their game uh, just as hard, so I, I, I think I'm, I'm excited about it. So I think 4G is going to break that that logjam that you talked about. And, and I would I, I, let me just also answer a question you didn't ask. I think the competition that you're seeing now is phenomenally good, because the competition ultimately produces multiple winners, because it's creating this very, very, very large market, and the applications people are coming, and the model that I'm talking about will get built out and proven. 
he will be forced to, in fact, he chooses to put massive amount of capital into building up the infrastructure. We'll work very hard to respond to the, the Apple product line with our own, and you know, it's good for consumers. Go ahead. Actually, that was a great lead into the question that I had. Uh, at lunch, you um, apparently at a press briefing were talking about competition in the U.S. wireless market as being um, uh, very, very competitive. And it's, it was striking to me because I was talking to some people from Finland recently who were talking about how in their country, when somebody doesn't have access to, like they can't get cell reception in their attic, that they called up the phone company and the companies were competing to provide that service. In America, we don't have that because of the differences, as you were talking about, with CDMA versus um, GSM. And I think it's actually to the detriment of particularly your company because you do have the best network and the best coverage. Um, and so I'm wondering with the transition to 4G, and you were talking about standards related to that, is, is that also going to allow us to have better freedom to move between networks, to make decisions based on um, you know, which network is providing us with the best service, like even on a day-to-day -day basis or those sorts of things? Is that, is that part of the promise of 4G? Yeah, the the um, 4G standard uh, will allow for device manufacturers to uh, design to a common standard. So all you have to do is take a SIM card out like you do in Europe, and you'll be able to move from carrier to carrier. Okay, so I think that's the, that would be the plan, that you could see how it would work out. But it also sounds like you'll be first with the broad well, LTE and, rollout, yeah. and so... Well, that's true. And then the other point is that the frequencies on which 4G operates is in the lower bands, and therefore it penetrates walls a little bit better. So you'll see in-building coverage instantly a lot better, and then we'll work on deploying the other kinds of devices you need to deploy to make in-building coverage. And you know, amazing, we've come from a point in time where uh, people now expect the phone to work in the fifth basement uh, four well, wells. Twenty-five percent of them yeah. don't have line, yeah, lines. Yeah, right, anymore. exactly. So the answer is it's a good it's a good opportunity for us. I, I don't view that as a problem. It's something we we need to do. And rem you'll remember that you competed with us for four billion dollars for the seven hundred megahertz spectrum. Remember that fight? That wasn't a fight. Yes. Well, you won. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, you you were never going to buy that. <laughs> does uh, does four G make um, sort of land based high bandwidth connectivity obsolete, you know, even Fios as well as other forms of, of high bandwidth connectivity, or, or do, do you sort of foresee that people for whom connectivity is really important so, will have both? So here's the way we would look at that. I think that, Eric's right, for mobility, they'll get you 10 megabits to your person or to your device. We still think there'll be a huge market for wide area, you know, wide area, uh, Wi-Fi networks or even fiber optic networks for that 100 megabit applications, particularly for commercial and television. So I think what you'll find is the market will segment, but we think there's, there's still a, a lot of room for 100 megabits to a fixed location to do video conferencing and things like that. Actually, you know, um, if you don't mind, this is, this is kind of right up your alley. So last week was the 44th anniversary of Star Trek, right? You all knew that, I knew you did. And um, so if you think of all the things that Star Trek has done, it's all come true. There's only two things left, right? Holographic uh, capabilities, which we're now starting to play with, yeah. and then teleporting, right? So we're okay. going to beam Eric all over the world. <laughs> so you now, have, you now have all these engineers working on quantum physics and how to take photons and move them from here to there. So you so, first, Ivan. So no, we're going to do this. <laughs> so, so, so you're going to need, you're going to need 100 megabit networks into, into fixed locations to teleport Eric all over the planet. You're going to need to do that. Right. Um, yeah. Do you anticipate that power users should be sort of in their own class with not on an all-you-can-eat plan for, for data? Sort of, I mean, a 30 megabit. If, I, if I'm, you know, if I watch videos 24 hours a day in HD and I overtax the network, should I sort of not yeah. be allowed to do that? This is a user? highly charged question, I could tell. <laughs> um, here's what I would say. I think this should be bundles and tiers. I don't think this should be, we don't think this should be, Eric thinks everything should be free. We don't come from that class. But I think there's, there shouldn't be some linear model. Uh, I don't think that's right. So there should be natural bundles. And if you happen to use a, a 900 megabits a month, you might pay something for that bundle as opposed to somebody who might only use 10 or 15 megabits a month. So the market will get that right. But w we do believe there needs to be some tiering of pricing. 
One of the fundamental things to remember is that there's essentially infinite bandwidth in a strand of fiber, and there's very much not infinite bandwidth in the current wireless allocation. And so there are, there are in fact, fundamental differences in the technology, and those will be true for a long time. Go ahead. So a big part of my wife's job was uh, calling up various cell phone providers every month and going through the stacks and stacks of bills where each line that her company dealt with was on a different plan. And it seems like, uh, I think she actually said that Verizon was one of the better companies to deal with. But the, the sense that I've gotten dealing with a lot of the cell phone companies is the billing model works a lot like the banks do, where they have kind of convoluted rules that, that maximize their profits and make it completely impossible to, under, to predict what's going to happen with billing. Do you think that there's hope for having something where you can walk up to the person and say, what will my bottom line price be and know that that's what you're going to pay every month? Yeah, now, if I may answer that, but, but I, I want to be, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. That's a rich person's view of the world because the average person is very price sensitive. And so what we have found, what we have found in, in, the, in the process, yes, we're complicated and we should simplify it, I guarantee that. I, so I take that comment. But the whole issue of bringing everything down to a bottom line, one price, it's not the way people work. It's not the way stereo components got sold. It's not the way almost anything is. So the struggle we have is how you mass customize. You give people enough information. Have we gone overboard? Sure. But I, so I think the issue of thinking about nirvana being, we're going to simplify it all into one price and it's going to be $69.99 a month. The day you do that, people are going to say, itemize the bill for me. And this is what the market does. So I think this is a sort of a, a burden we have, we have to figure out. Um, but so well, I, particularly for the, poor, for the poorer people where that extra $15 charge or $30 charge because their kid was using tax Which is 80% of the market. Pushes them over there into overdraft right. fees now that they get charged. Oh, no question. So the things we could do better, there's no question. But, but I, my comment, though, is what we're trying to figure out is how to give the customer as much control over how much information they want, as opposed to us itemizing everything. Now, of course, in our case, not to complain, but you have state taxes, you got local taxes, so we're the greatest tax collector ever, so you have to itemize a lot of, a lot of those things. This has been a, a, this is a driving problem in our industry for a long time. Never quite ever get this right. We're getting better at it. We just came out with our newest, newest, 100th version of the newest bill. And so we, we keep trying to work this. So you, your comment's well taken. But I yeah, just thank you for trying. I, I wouldn't want you to okay. oversimplify it to think it really gets down to one price. Go ahead. doesn't work. Thank you. So um, I know you said that with 4G, of course, people would have SIM cards as they have with GSM. But I want to ask you about something bolder, which is moving the United States away from the subsidy lock model as overseas they have done in a number of countries. And T-Mobile in the United States will let you have your phone for $20 a month less if you bring your own Nexus One that you bought directly, for example, into them. Uh, do you see Verizon and other American carriers moving away from subsidy lock and allowing a lot more flexibility in how people buy handsets and yeah. how they move from customer and so you win the customer every month with good service rather than a contract? Right. So I guess you don't have an opinion about this, I guess. No. <laughs> okay. so, I'm open to all views. Yeah. Can, can but, I, he has, but he has an opinion. Yeah. Can I offer a couple of facts as, mm -hmm. as we answer that? So average usage in Europe of cell phones, right, is um, about uh, 200 minutes a month. Here it's 900 minutes a month. So the model that says you bring your own device has actually created a lot less utility out of the network and the service. The issue in the States has been because of the very question the gentleman there just asked, that the entry barriers for people to buy the service were such that if we didn't subsidize the handset, we couldn't penetrate the market. Now, what we, what we would like to do is move more to the next generation of devices to be more like the PC. So you buy your own, you get your connection. What we have to make sure, though, is we don't suppress demand because we create an entry price that's so high that people can't make it. That's why you have contracts. Now, people don't like contracts, but it's, it has allowed us to penetrate the market with more devices. So we have, in data, in the US, higher penetration of data, higher penetration of usage than almost anywhere in the planet, perhaps except Japan. Now, so the issue is we need to migrate. Now, I think what you'll find us trying to do is testing, as we roll out 4G, different classes of devices to see what those subsidy levels might be and where we need to go with them. So you, you, your point's not wrong, and, and we got it. 
but it's not as simple as giving the market a cold turkey shower and saying from now on out, you're going to spend a, a tablet, it's going to cost five or six hundred dollars. And Eric would be the first one to call me and say, well, give it away. Absolutely. You should right. be giving it away. We're had this conversation. Right. Exactly. And, and the answer to that is, it's a hard issue when you spent 30 or 40 billion dollars Think of all the money that you can make. You send this thing, there's all this right. downstream revenue, you know, you upsell. Right. We had this conversation. Yeah, we did. And because you make all the money, we don't. You know, What's wrong with this? The answer is, we got it. Checks in the mail, Eric. We got it. Okay, I hope that the answer is we're sensitive to your point. We've got to transition to it and get there in a way that balances the business model needs of By the way, I hope I wasn't system. saying that you have to get rid of subsidies, but just that T-Mobile's model, which allows both to exist, I think is, is a good way to migrate. So, thanks. T-Mobile is not us. Right. The... Uh, I want to thank everybody again. Thank you, Ivan, for everything you've done. We depend on you and everybody else. You really did make it possible for us to actually be here and talk talk, and so forth and so on. And the future is really enabled by this. I think, Nikesh, maybe it's time for us to get off the stage and turn this whole event off to you. Over well, to I just want to say thank you very much, Ivan. Thank, thank you, you, Eric. Okay. Let's just have a round of applause for the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have nothing else left to say but a big thank you to all of you for being patient and listening to all of our speakers and interacting uh, over the last two days with each other and our speakers. So big round of applause for our audience. Thank you very much for being here. And I hope you enjoyed it.